Welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm Ashley Murphy, the founder and principal of Arate Wealth Strategies Australia. Tonight's topic is Bridging the Pacific Tax Smart Aussie Estates for US Beneficiaries. Okay, so uh, just for your information uh, about our YouTube channel, anyone that registers for the presentation will automatically be notified when the presentation goes up on YouTube. It's a question I get every month. People say, I can't make it. Uh, can you let me know when it goes on YouTube? And all you need to do is to register and then you'll be notified automatically. But if you are interested in these topics and the format with which uh, they are delivered in, which is a lot like tonight, uh, then I would encourage you to check out our YouTube channel, the Arate Well Strategies Australia YouTube channel, uh, and you can see uh, all the, the, the 50 plus uh, videos that I've done on these niche topics that pertain to Australians in America or Americans in Australia. So we are a private wealth manager that works with these three types of clients. You see here, the Australian business owner living between the US and Australia, the high net worth Australian family currently living in the US, and lastly, the Australian executive and family having permanently relocated to the US needing help tying up their loose ends in Australia, you can see a list of some of the goals and the results uh, for that we've achieved for those firms, uh, for those clients, excuse me. So I should mention also that, uh, the, the, that our business is growing thanks to, to your support and also for the, the word that's getting out there in the community. We're approaching 100 million in assets under management, which puts us into SEC registration territory growing out of the state of Minnesota, where I am presently. A little bit about me. So really, I was born into this cross-border, or I should, I should say I was destined to be in this cross-border uh, financial planning niche. Why? As a tri-citizen of Australia, the UK, and the US, I grew up in Brisbane to an American mother, Australian father, having been born in England, studied at the University of Queensland, moved to the US almost 20 years ago, and it will be, interestingly, almost to the day, 20 years when I move back on January 18th of next year. Anyone who's interested in that whole story, there's a five part, I guess you could call it a, a blog blogisode, a webisode, webisode. Let's let's run with webisode, um, where my wife and I have documented all the the planning moves that we went through as we moved from the US to Australia for two and a half years. Then back, we've now been back for about 18 months, and then we plan on permanently relocating to Australia early next year. Anyhow, um, so I, I did the CFP studies as a runner-up student of the year at UC Berkeley back in 2012. I started with the CFA, did not end up completing that, uh, and have an, a, a, a graduate diploma in financial planning in Australia, obviously also the US, and also the founder of the Global Financial Planning Institute, where we run courses and conferences for international financial planners that want to provide a fiduciary standard of care working with clients whose financial lives cross borders. Also a regular conference speaker just spoke last week uh, at uh, the XYPN conference, which was conveniently located here in Minneapolis. Uh, just note some disclosures about tonight's presentation. So this does not constitute personal financial tax, legal or investment advice. It's at this point that I wanted to stop and say, originally we had a speaker lined up to do tonight's presentation, but uh, upon her further investigating the requirements for the state with which she's registered, she decided that it was not possible to do that in compliance with uh, with the, the strictures uh, that she has to follow. And so this material, has been sourced in partnership with a cross-border uh, estate planner, but uh, unfortunately, due to the compliance restrictions that she faces, uh, I won't be able to mention who that is, uh, but th that person remains uh, as a referral partner uh, of mine who provides cross-border financial planning between Australia and the US. Okay, so the outline for tonight's presentation. First, we're gonna talk about the estate tax system, how estates are taxed in the US and key differences between the US and the Australian system. Next, we'll talk about the tax implications for US beneficiaries, what potential tax liabilities and reporting requirements uh, for US heirs receiving Australian inheritances. We'll talk about the difference between a non-grantor versus a grantor trust, a key distinction in US trust law. 
uh, foreign trusts for U.S. tax purposes, IRS reporting obligations for U.S. persons, which we've covered at length in other presentations, but they have to be mentioned again here for, for various reasons, uh, various other issue, miscellaneous issues that don't neatly align under any particular heading. And then I'll introduce you to Bert and Janice Winter uh, and the, the interesting cross-border situation that they have. Okay, so the estate tax system and how estates are, uh, are, are differently taxed uh, between Australia and the US. So the US has a federal estate tax. Uh, it's a 40% rate that applies to estates valued over $13.61 million in 2024. Now, please note that that estate tax level is, is scheduled to sunset at the end of 2025. Uh, presently, that's set to revert to $7 million. However, with the flux that exists in US leadership, and, and we'll have some clear idea on that in about two weeks' time, hopefully, fingers crossed we have some clarity in two weeks, um, then it, it could change. We really don't know what that's going to be, but currently it's scheduled to revert back to $7 million. Note that that's also per person. So a married couple, you're looking at double that figure. So you're looking about $27 million before you have to worry about US estate tax. So a, a pretty significant sum of money uh, for most people, uh, but, uh, but, but that's what it is, a 40% uh, estate tax limit. Now, Australia doesn't work this way. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a second, but actually on the, on the next slide, but the non-resident, non-citizens of the US, as the US terms these folks, the charming term, non-resident aliens, they're only subject to a federal estate tax limit on their US based assets or CITES, CITES is Latin for, for, for where they're based, up to $60,000. Now, before you, you panic, Australia and the US have an estate tax treaty. And what that estate tax treaty allows for is for Australian non-resident aliens who have US CITES assets, they're able to actually take advantage of uh, a proportion of the, the worldwide assets. Uh, they're able to use that unified gift exemption, that 13.61 million that we saw, uh, as a proportion of their worldwide assets. So in other words, it's not unlike if you saw my prior presentation on claiming social security from Australia, here are the rules that exist and if you have a, a treaty with the US, those rules may not apply. And that's what we see here. So there is a $60,000 non-resident alien estate tax limit. But if you're from Australia, you don't really need to worry about that too much. The limits are going to be significantly higher before you have to worry about US estate tax. What you do have to worry about, however, in the US is a, a patch quilt of different uh, estate state level estate taxes and inheritance taxes. As you can see here, Washington State, Oregon have estate taxes, as does my current domicile, Minnesota, uh, which applies above three million and, and ranges from 13 to 16 percent. Not a small number in and of itself. Uh, New York State has a has an a, an estate tax and Maine and a, and a few others in the Northeast. Uh, there's also inheritance taxes. So the uh, the neighboring state to the south of me, Iowa, they have an inheritance tax. Nebraska has an inheritance an inheritance tax. Kansas uh, and Pennsylvania. There's a, a small number of states uh, that you see in here that that also have them. And heavens forbid you, uh, you happen to live in Maryland, where there is both an an state estate tax and an inheritance tax. So. Uh, watch out those that are in Maryland, they really want to be doing their estate tax planning or their estate planning in general. Okay, so Australia works very differently. I've often said, just for a funny way of saying it, that Australia's got good a good PR team working for it in regards to uh, an exit tax and in regards to estate taxes, because I put it to you that Australia still taxes those events they just tax it differently. And so they don't get the bad PR by saying that they have a death tax or that they have an exit tax. They still tax it, they just tax it differently. So there's no estate tax as such in Australia, but there's also no step up in basis as we'll explore on an asset class by asset class basis. So 
really your Australian tax implications are going to vary depending on whether your beneficiary is a resident or non-resident of Australia. The nature of the asset, so in Australia, it's, it's kind of complicated, hence why we're sitting down for an hour here to do a whole webinar to talk about how different assets are taxed depending on the resident or non-resident status of, uh, of that beneficiary. Uh, and whether the beneficiary is a superannuation tax dependent. That's another area that requires a special definition. So they're both U.S. and Australian tax implications when a U.S. person is a beneficiary of an Australian estate. That's the, the takeaway here, and hence why we're running this webinar tonight. Okay, so in the event of a primary residence being bequeathed as part of an estate, Australia is going to look at that as generally exempt from capital gains tax if the decedent qualified for the main residence exemption, meaning the deceased, this was their main residence. Uh, there's also a two-year uh, uh, timing requirement that applies to the sale by the executor or beneficiary to retain that capital gains free uh, status on the main residence. Now, how does that differ for a U.S. beneficiary? Well, the U.S. would typically look at this and say, we're giving you a step up in basis on assets inherited at death. And the U.S. applies that also to foreign property, that is property that's outside of, of the U.S., non-U.S. sided and has really no U.S. claim whatsoever. So um, the U.S. would look at that American beneficiary who's just inherited uh, mom or dad's uh, a house back in Australia and say, great, whatever it's worth on the date of death is your US taxable basis on that property. The Australian side could work, it, this, it could work out extremely well uh, inheriting the main residence because then there's the, the two years uh, exemption that's, uh, that's, that's given on the Australian side. What about investment real estate? How does that work? So this is the, 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 the typical capital gain property treatment in Australia. And that is, there's no step up in basis. The heir inherits the decedent's cost basis. So if they bought that investment real estate decades ago, then that is the cost basis for the decedent. Uh, and there's no CGT discounts for non-residents on an eventual sale. I wanna come back to that. They're, they're very well could be, assuming the sale takes place 12 months henceforth for an Australian resident beneficiary. The lack of the CGT discount, just going to the second bullet point there, the 9% CGT discount for non-residents on an eventual sale, that is a killer. That is an absolute killer of estates. And it's making, it's like writing a tip to the Australian government that you do not need to make. There's, there's, it's entirely avoidable with appropriate estate planning that is uh, that, that is done. And that is the, the, the simple answer to that would either be to have the estate itself sell that asset because the estate is an Australian tax resident uh, or alternatively, if the, the family had multiple beneficiaries and one of them was an Australian resident and they had other property that could be used to give to non-resident, non-Australian resident beneficiaries, then that would be the way to do it because otherwise that's a tax time bomb right there having non-residents inherit Australian uh, Australian investment real estate. What about a stock portfolio? So for Australian resident beneficiaries, same deal as we saw with the investment real estate. There is the decedent's cost basis that's inherited and you can apply that 50% capital gains discount on the eventual sale, assuming it's been more than 12 months. Uh, what about for the U.S. beneficiary of that stock portfolio? Well, not so fast. There's CGT event K3 can be triggered if the beneficiary is a non-resident of Australia. And this is, this is I should say, the impetus for tonight's presentation came from a very, very interesting fact pattern of a client of mine that I've been working with for about three years. They, they spent some time in the, the late 1970s and 80s uh, working in the U.S., they've got three children of whom uh, one lives in the U.S., two live in Australia. The, of the two that live in Australia, one is a, a, a U.K. and Australian citizen, and the other is a U.S. and Australian citizen. So a fantastic example for a case study here. But this is one of the points that I was trying to make, is that by having an Australian stock portfolio, 
if a non-resident beneficiary inherits that, look at this. What are the implications of capital event K3? Any capital gain or loss on the asset is realized immediately and must be included in the final tax return of the deceased. This can result in immediate tax liability for the estate, which may re reduce the overall value of the inheritance for all beneficiaries. You compare that to holding the, if it was a US portfolio that the, the estate was holding, then it never became taxable Australian property. It would have received a step up in basis and not been subject to this tax at all. So the tax really on the stock portfolio, I, I think you could make a tongue in cheek case to say it's a discretionary tax. It's, it's a tax paid by choice because there's really no need to do that uh, if you were to structure your estate appropriately uh, to, to, to even it out between your beneficiaries. But for this asset, uh, for, for, for liquid assets, you could simply hold them in the US and it's not taxable Australian property, gets a step up in basis to US beneficiaries. Uh, and, and that's a pretty good outcome right there. Quite aside from all the other benefits the US uh, investment environment has, which I've mentioned previously, and as is documented in Morningstar's by any global investor fund experience study, where they talk about the costs of investing, the uh, disclosures that need to be made, uh, and the taxes that are applicable. And according to that, Australia and the US actually received the top mark. But then when we look into that in further detail, you see that the US is actually uh, head and shoulders above Australia. It's just that the rest of the world is not nearly as competitive as either country. The Netherlands also receives a top mark as well. Okay, indirect stock holdings. So this is an important point. So the, the Australian heir, who presumably does not have, is not a dual citizen of the US, just in this narrow example in this one slide, they might hold a diversified portfolio of Australian managed funds. And if they did, and the US beneficiary inherits that, could be a big problem, a really, really big problem, in fact, because that portfolio would be known as what's called a passive foreign investment company. A PFIC came about in the 1986 Tax Reform Act under Reagan, and it was brought about because the US managed investment industry felt that they were losing out to European funds where the tax laws were different, where they could uh, roll over capital gains and not declare until the time of eventual sale. And so they came up with this PFIC rule, which is really a, a, a sledgehammer for a nail of a problem. And they've said, if you hold any foreign investment that meets one of these two tests, you see at the bottom of your screen, if more than 75% of its income is passive in nature, passive being dividends, interest rents, royalties, capital gains, that kind of thing, or if 50% or more of the company's assets held generate positive income, you've got a PFIC. And what do we know about PFICs? Once a PFIC, always a PFIC. And it doesn't get a step up in basis. So this would be financial harakiri in the estate of someone with heirs, US heirs is, is what I would say. Let's move on here and talk about superannuation. So super distributed to tax dependents, who are they? Spouses, minor children, or if you're not a minor, as uh, sadly I wasn't a minor, but was not financially independent. Uh, I was not deemed a tax uh, dependent at the, 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 the sad passing of my mother when I was 20 years old. Uh, so I was not deemed a, a, a tax dependent. Thus, uh, there was a 15% tax that was withheld on the taxable component of her superannuation account, uh, which was appropriate uh, that, that, that it be done that way because that's that's what the rules are. Uh, what about for the US uh, beneficiary? Uh, the tax benefit distributions are usually taxable in the US. Why is that? Because, uh, because Australia would look at this and say, what is superannuation? We look in the Internal Revenue Code, all the tens of thousands of pages in that, and nowhere is a reference to this thing called superannuation. And so they look at it and they say, this is some kind of foreign grantor trust or, or some employee benefits trust, or what, we don't know really what it is for sure, but we don't like it and we're going to tax it. And so that's how the US uh, approaches that. Life insurance is pretty straightforward, provided it's not held within super. Lump sum proceeds are generally not accessible, uh, uh, accessible, excuse me, in Australia, and they're not uh, generally accessible either in the US. Uh, if held within super, then you could have an issue there 
the ta it's tax free if the lump sum death payment is made to uh, tax dependents, as we went over earlier, um, but otherwise can be taxable. So, the, and this is one of the reasons why, yet again, in previous presentations, I come back to this rule of thumb: if you have the ability to get life insurance in the U.S., get it in the get it in the U.S. because it's cheaper, even after considering the tax deductibility of life insurance purchased through superannuation. It's still cheaper in the U.S., um, presumably because of the size of the U.S. market, uh, the, 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 the maybe better underwriting, perhaps, uh, better returns on investment. A whole range, I don't know that for sure about the better returns on investment, but what I do know for sure is that the, 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 the premiums on uh, an, an equivalent policy in Australia uh, are often significantly higher. So, and then you have to worry about are the beneficiaries going to end up paying 15% in tax uh, when in the US that's that's not an issue. Closely held businesses. Now, this gets complicated very quickly. Uh, Australian beneficiary, a resident Australian beneficiary, the taxation is usually deferred until the shares are sold by the beneficiary. Again, uh, it would be subject to the capital gains rules that we saw, saw, saw earlier. So 50% discount to, to resident beneficiaries uh, or, or uh, it's, if, if the, the gains happen to be realized and dividends are paid to shareholders, then clearly that's a taxable event. Non-resident beneficiary, yet again, we have that capital gains event K3. What do we know about that? We know that it's bad news. So suddenly... Your foreign heir, and I'm thinking back to a prospective client I had lunch with in Brisbane when I was there in July, uh, suddenly you've got a US heir to your Australian business. They, uh, the, 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 the heir, sorry, excuse me, the, 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 the um, decedent passes away, the US person inherits these Australian businesses and bam, suddenly, there is uh, there, there's capital gains taxes that are owed. And depending on the size of that business, that may not be a gain that's able to be paid from liquid cash reserves, in which case it would lead to an immediate unwinding of that business in order to pay the Australian capital gains tax. Why? Because you've got a foreign beneficiary of taxable Australian property. Uh, residency of directors and shareholders, where is CMC? Central management and control. Um, so we need to figure out who, if it's if this business is held within a trust, who controls the trust? What's the trust residency? I'll cover in a in, in a few slides from now what the definition is of a U.S. trust and an Australian trust. Excuse me. Uh, what about the the the, the difference here for a, inheriting a closely held business for a U.S. beneficiary? Generally, you inherit shares at the fair market value of the destined state of death. It's a very simple rule. You get a step up in basis, but you do need to worry about what's called a controlled foreign corporation rule of the US. And this is where things get tricky. Yet again, uh, if, if this business is owned within a trust, as, as many businesses often are, uh, are we looking at a grantor uh, or non-grantor uh, trust situation? There's going to be a host of complex and expensive uh, US tax returns and, and, and informational filings that need to be completed if you are indeed uh, the, the inheritor of a controlled foreign corporation uh, within a some sort of trust structure. So what is a CFC? Let's quickly define that. It is not an ozone gas uh, in this context. It is a controlled foreign corporation. Uh, it's gotta be a foreign company. The company is a foreign company. The company has at least one US shareholder who is a greater than 10% individual, 12% partnership. And the U.S. shareholder, own, the U.S. shareholders own on any day during the foreign corporation's tax year more than fifty percent of either the company's total value or the company's company's total voting stock. If you have either of those situations, and the instance I'm thinking of with the prospective client with whom I had lunch, that's exactly what would unfold for for her and and her son in uh, in the U.S. Okay, non-grantor versus grantor trust. This is really a, a significant distinction of a type of trusts that exists in the US. I myself am not an estate planner, so I don't wanna say things out of turn on the Australian side, but it's my understanding that Australia doesn't have 
maybe someone will correct me, but Australia does not have the concept of a non-grantor trust. A non-grantor trust is essentially a separate entity. That is, there's an irrevocable gift of property made to the trust. The trust files its own tax returns. The trust has its own, uh, it's its own thing, essentially. It's able to make distributions according to its trust documents. It files its own tax returns. It's a different entity. A grantor trust, on the other hand, is still connected to the person that made that original donation of property or gift of property to that trust. So rules in the Internal Revenue Code can apply if a grantor, i.e. the person who creates the trust, makes a gratuitous transfer to a trust and holds certain powers, or someone besides the grantor holds a power of withdrawal over those trust funds. Trust income and assets are attributed to the back to the grantor or owner to the extent of their ownership interest. Now, someone has chatted in, Megan, here. Uh, apologies, Ashley, I need to drop off for a meeting. Well, that's quite fine. Uh, looking forward to listening to the rest when it's up on YouTube. Well, how polite of Megan to do that. That's very nice. Um, okay. Foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes. So for U.S. tax purposes, uh, for, I think the U.S. make it incredibly easy with their two tests here. A foreign trust is a trust that is not a U.S. domestic trust. Pretty, pretty straightforward so far. A trust is a U.S. domestic trust if it meets the court test and the control test. The court test. The court test. A trust meets the court test if a U.S. court has authority to determine substantially all the issues regarding the administration of the trust. The trust needs to be written and administered under the law of a U.S. state. Simple. South Dakota, uh, Nevada, it's, it's Delaware. Choose choose your state where you want your, your, your trust to be written. Next is the control test. A trust meets the control test if U.S. persons have the authority to control substantial decisions of the trust without any other person having the right to veto decisions. Thus, you can have a trust in the U.S. that is not considered a U.S. trust if you've got foreign control people, as one example. Um, what are some of these other things? The, to do with, uh, with with decisions and control, decisions regarding distributions, investment decisions, legal action, change of trustee and succession, the ability to terminate the trust. Okay, so if it meets those two tests, then you're looking at a U.S. trust. As mentioned earlier, uh, I've covered this in detail in other presentations, but because we're talking about estate planning and often gifts are happening in, in when it comes to estate planning, it's certainly uh, inheritances would, would frequently exceed this amount. If the aggregate amount received from a non-resident alien, i.e. a non-US person, or foreign estate exceeds $100,000 during the taxable year, the US person beneficiary must report that on a Form 3520. Penalty for not filing timely is the greater of $10,000 or up to 25% of the value of the gift or bequest. Significant penalty. So you don't need, this is the thing is it's not unlike the the F bar that's mentioned there or the the FATCA form the IRS form 8938 and that is these are informational filings there is no reason you should not file them if you're afraid of taxes you should be afraid of not filing them because of the tax so if you don't file it then you get hit with penalties if you do file it there's nothing really to worry about except now the U.S. knows, well, and it's, I shouldn't say accept as if that's to excuse it, but the consequence of that is that the U.S. will now know about it, and so they will be looking to receive uh, their the, the, the accessible income that that asset produces in the future. That's why they want to know about it. They also want to know about it, it's actually for an entirely unrelated reason, came about, FBAR came about in the 1974 Bank Secrecy Act, and it was largely to do with tracking terrorist financing. Uh, so that's where it originally came from. And then I think eventually uh, it became a cash cow when they realized that they could make the penalties uh, ridiculously high, which which is where they are today. So what else needs to... So FBARs, if you have a bank account balance more than 10,000 US dollars at any point throughout the year, you've got to file an FBAR. The FATCA form, that's 8930, it's a bit more complicated because there's different thresholds that apply to residents and non-residents and filing status and location of property it's it, it actually gets quite a bit complicated but the thresholds are uh, uh, somewhat higher for form 8938 pfic reporting passive foreign investor company i spoke about that earlier uh you want to report there pfics are kind of 
they are such a hassle in almost all instances i would say 99 or 98 percent of cases i've seen the tax compliance is worse than the actual penalty tax itself because people generally don't hold significant foreign uh, managed investments. They would typically see the light, realize that the U.S. offers, you know, has the deepest capital markets, broadest, broadest range, lowest costs, best disclosure, and would typically have the majority of their investable assets on the U.S. side. That being the case, they've got small holdings overseas. The PFIC taxes aren't really that bad, but every year that you have to pay your, your accountant thousands of dollars more to file your PFIC forms, that's when the pain really uh, sets in, quite aside from the time it takes you to provide all the information that the accountant is asking for. Uh, the controlled foreign corporation reporting, that's a hassle that's going to add to your tax bill as well. And foreign trust reporting, uh, don't forget about that. There could be... Uh, nasty penalties that apply there if, as we saw earlier if, if they're failed to to to, to, to be so filed uh state inheritance tax exposures federal gift tax exposures for covered gifts or bequests that is uh, this is a whole different topic that i've done several webinars on and this is due with the u.s exit tax as per the heart act of 2008 um, that's to say u.s permanent residents or citizens that leave the US and meet one of three tests. That is, they have a global net worth in excess of $2 million. Very easy to do if you uh, are into your 30s or 40s or, or older and maybe have a house in, in one of the major cities. Uh, very easy to have a net worth in excess of $2 million. Did you have a federal, an average federal tax liability, not income, tax bill basically of $201,000 in 2024 averaged over the past five years. You're going to be making pretty good income to have a tax liability as high as that. I estimate you're making above 650,000 married filing joint, um, but it could happen in the event of, say, uh, the vesting of some, some RSUs. Suddenly in one year, there's maybe $2 million or more of RSUs that vest, bang, your average over that five-year period could skew you above that $201,000 figure. The third test is, have you been current with your state and federal filings for the past five years? So that is what will trigger uh, an exit tax. But worse than that is a sleeper provision hinted at in this bullet point. And I forget the exact line uh, in, the, in, the, in the code uh, that, that deals with this, but it's essentially a gift or request made to the heir, the US heir, I should mention that it wouldn't matter if they were Australians and not dual citizens, but if they're, they're US citizens and a covered expat, that is to say someone who, who had to pay that exit tax makes a gift to that person, they're subject to a 40% uh, gift tax exposure on that gift received. So there's been very little uh, talk about that one because the, the exit tax is so relatively new, being only from 2008 that we haven't seen uh, the, the US heirs of covered expats yet receiving those gifts and thus uh, case law and examples uh, getting out there in the press. Uh, and then of course their own federal and state uh, estate tax exposures when they pass. So you can you're probably getting a sense that uh, this kind of cross-border estate planning becomes uh, exceedingly complicated and i couldn't agree more uh cross-border considerations with uh trusts optimizing tax efficiency and asset protection what do we have here uh well we have a first we have another chat peter williams writes my wife is an australian citizen on a green card i am a u.s citizen we've bought a house in california and live in california okay the home her adult children lived in Australia, she wants to leave to them. They all live in Australia. Is it a good idea for her to form a trust in Australia and place the house in it? Probably not, Peter, uh, for reasons that you'll see coming up. But I have to say, just with what I mentioned in my disclosures earlier, more so than, than most other presentations, this is one where I, I really want to respect uh, my my partner that, that, uh, that I worked with on developing this presentation and not uh not pretend that we're going to give individualized advice so uh in this case all i'm really going to say is stay tuned because we deal with exactly that scenario and the answer is 
Probably not, because what is an Australian trust to a US beneficiary could cause real problems. Okay, uh, let's continue here. So uh, who's in control? The appointment, trustee, succession, and residency. What is the nature of the beneficiary's interest? Does the beneficiary own a whole or part of the trust? Has the beneficiary uh, transferred funds to the trust? Could trigger US grant or trust rules if this were the case, estate tax implications uh, possibly for the beneficiary. So let's just uh, go back a slide and get this in context. So uh, cross-border considerations with trust. So this, this does come much more closely to answering your, your uh, question there, actually. It's it's the beginning of, of, uh, of, of that answer. So it, having a US beneficiary as the owner of uh, such an account, when the trust income may be accumulated, which happens within a non-grantor trust, as we know, and a US person might be the ultimate distributee of that income, that person is a US beneficiary, okay? The US beneficiary can be treated as the owner under the grantor trust rules if they have power to vest the trust corpus or income in themselves, they've made gr gratuitous transfers to the trust uh, and, and last safe distributions, trust anti-deferral rules can apply. Now, anti-deferral rules, to me, that's a known unknown. That's, a, that's, that's what you want to talk to your, your, your tax attorney about, the, the anti-deferral rules. Um, I'm not even going to pretend to get into that, uh, that but that is a known unknown for me. So the U.S. beneficiary is an owner that can, uh, that can trigger all sorts of complications. Other issues. So other issues that to do with one's uh, estate planning here. Uh, on the U.S. side, you've got your will, your power of attorney in the relevant state that the, the individual is in, estate tax return filing requirement, uh, of course, if, if indeed they meet that threshold, and then the IRS transfer certificate, you'll see I, I provided a further definition of this. This, this is tricky when there's a non-resident beneficiary of a U.S. estate. And I can tell you that with, with, with uh, investment accounts, this, this gets difficult. The, the U.S. custodians don't like to distribute to non-resident aliens because uh, they're afraid of doing the wrong thing. Often they seek, this is the, the counsel I've received from a separate estate planner, often they seek to be compelled to make the distribution. Thus, they, they, they can claim that it wasn't a discretionary decision that they made in distributing a state to a non-resident non beneficiary. What is a transfer certificate? And it's an IRS transfer certificate filing requirement that pertains to the process of obtaining a federal transfer. Sorry, it's a circular definition here. I should have just started here. A federal transfer certificate is issued from the IRS for the estates of non-resident decedents who own assets in the US. The certificate is necessary to legally transfer US situated assets to beneficiaries or heirs and ensures that the estate has met its US federal tax obligations. So you can't even distribute an estate assuming there's, there's uh, real property in there, for instance, uh, without one of these transfer certificates. What about other issues on the Australian side? Uh, the US person um, as executor of an Australian estate can create issues there. What, what might it do if a US heir inherits an Australian trust? Well, we, we just had that question chatted in a minute ago. It might create uh, trust residency problems for that US person with a host of tax reporting problems for them on the US side. Now they're the owner of some foreign trust. Um, and, and, and that could attract a hard look from the IRS on when did they obtain that discretionary authority and, and what, what is the scope of their powers over that trust. It can also trigger FBAR reporting as well. Suddenly you inherit mom's uh, account or, or dad's account and you fail to, to, to realize that's now part of, you may, it, you, it, it may the, the legal title may not have fully transferred yet, but if you have access to that account for, for some reason, then it should be listed as part of your FBAR reporting as well. And we have already covered what the penalties are for not doing that. US person as agent under financial power of attorney creates, as I just mentioned, the FBAR reporting obligations. So let's look, let's take a, a breath, a deep breath here, see how we're doing on time. 
I think we're perfectly uh, on time right now uh, and talk about the winter family. So we've got Bert and Janice, uh, Bert's 83, Janice is 81. They're retired dual citizens living in Australia. They've got three children. The three children are Jill. She's Australian and British, lives in Australia with her, uh, her, her Australian husband. There's Liam who has Australian citizenship and a US green card and lives in Connecticut with his American wife. And there's Karina, who has dual Australian and American citizenship, but lives quite near mom and dad, uh, but she is a dual citizen US Australian person. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. The winners are concerned about the tax implications of their estate planning choices as their Australian wills establish Australian trusts for their children. Well, no bueno, as we've seen for, uh, for our friend Liam here over in Connecticut. Why? Because he's now going to own a foreign trust and all the, the reporting that goes with that. Worse, what's in the trust? What if it was taxable Australian property? What if it was, excuse me, What if it was a stock portfolio, something like that? It's going to be immediately taxable upon the passing of the uh, of the executors. So the winners own property in Australia and the US. Uh, Australian assets, they've got uh, real, real property, like real estate, rental property in rural New South Wales and a rental property in Melbourne. And in the US, the only thing they have are investment accounts. The winners are considering the options to simplify their estate planning and minimize tax implications, including potentially relinquishing their U.S. citizenship. Now, this is such an intriguing case to me. This has been going on for about three years that, that I've been involved with it. And uh, this is a very, very intelligent uh, uh, client. But what's happened is they have counseled the, some, some highly regarded lawyers, in, estate planners in Australia, and the US that are both domestic in their orientation. They are excellent Australian estate planners and excellent American estate planners, neither of whom know very much at all about international matters. And so the advice that they're giving the client is whole, complete and appropriate in a purely domestic context, but their situation is not entirely domestic. And so it necessitates a cross-border uh, specialist to be able to to figure out what the best way is to structure this estate to create the least uh, headaches and retain the most uh, to the next generation at their passing. Uh, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at their balance sheet. You can see net worth uh, the, in the, the right hand column here about $9 million. Major assets include uh, a superannuation account, a taxable brokerage account that's uh, that's in Australia. Uh, there's some some taxable Vanguard holdings that's in the U.S. Uh, some life insurance policies that are in the U.S. Uh, what else do we have? We've got an IRA over at Schwab in the U.S. And we've got these real estate assets that uh, that I mentioned earlier. So all in all, you add it all up and we're looking at nine million U.S. dollars. That's an interesting number. Why? Because it tells us one. It's uh, it's it's less than the the present estate tax exemption thirteen point six one as we saw it set to sunset to seven million. However, uh, there is what's called portability. I believe it was in twenty seventeen that the the laws changed and 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 they brought in what's called estate portability. So even if one spouse uh, were to pass and and uh, not use up all of their estate tax exemption, the remainder is carried over and the 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 uh, second to die uh, is able to use the unused exemption of the, 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 the their spouse. So Bert and Janice, uh, potential US federal estate tax exposure on the death of the survivor, depending on what happens with the US estate tax. I just said a moment ago, not likely, but we don't know. Maybe the Maybe their estate will, uh, maybe the growth of their portfolio will be terrific as it has been for, for about the last uh, two and a half years prior to 2022, that is. Uh, 2022 I, I, it was, a, was, a, was a poor year uh, globally in investment markets with the raising, rapid raising of interest rates. 
Uh, possible state of state and inheritance tax exposure depending on the nature and location of U.S. assets. I could see that. Connecticut, what did we learn about Connecticut? It has, uh, if we go back a bunch of slides, which I'm just going to get out of the presentation and go back to where we were. Let's see if we can look at Connecticut and see what the exposure is there. Let's blow this up. Okay, CT. Connecticut is so small. Do they? I think I need to pull out my magnifying glass to see where it is. Oh, there it is. It's got an, an inheritance tax, but it's pretty high. 12.92 million. Okay, so maybe there's no estate tax problems that we need to worry about in Connecticut. I was afraid there might have been an inheritance tax there as well. Uh, oh, and then possible exit tax. If they surrender U.S. citizenship, uh, they would be deemed covered expats. That is because of having assets of $2 million. There are ways around that, and that comes back to um, a, a concept we mentioned earlier with the non-grantor trust. What if there was a gift made that got it out of the estate and then they were to, to relinquish their citizenship? This is what's referred to as the, the drop-off trust. Um, years of planning need to go into that to make that work. But another idea might be what if the Australian dual citizen heir, what if she dropped her her US citizenship? Might that simplify things? And and I think it would very not it wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would it might solve a couple. Okay, so we've got these Australian testamentary trusts. These are trusts that are created at the passing of the the executors. So uh, they spring into life uh, by, by by way of, of their passing. Uh, a trust is a foreign trust or non-resident trust. This is the Australian definition. Uh, it's 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 a foreign trust or non-resident trust if it is a resident trust estate in relation to a year of income. Hold on, let me say that again. A trust is a foreign trust or non-resident trust if it is not a resident trust estate in relation to a year of income, okay? And to be a resident trust estate, this is the Australian definition of of, uh, of a domestic trust. Uh, the trustee was an Australian resident at any time, uh, and the central management control of the trust was in Australia at any time during the year. So that's an interesting contrast to a US trust. Remember, the US trust has to be written in uh, accordance with one of the state's laws. Uh, that, that's apparently not a thing in Australia, but if it's if it's controlled from Australia, then, then it becomes an Australian trust. So, what we would know for sure is that Liam over there in Connecticut, who's just received his inheritance in a trust, bang, uh, as far as the Aussies are concerned, it's a non-resident trust. As far as the Americans are concerned, it's a non-resident trust. Um, so there, there could be issues here. What what are some things we should be mindful of in the structuring of, uh, of the Winter family's um, estate plan? Uh, beneficiary circumstances. So uh, do we need to be, this is more of a checklist of things to go through with the estate planner, litigation exposure, are they spendthrifts, are there creditors out there, is there maybe a divorce pending, um, control, who's in control of, uh, of what, uh, beneficiaries tax and financial position, their, their marginal tax rate, we don't want to be sending them additional income in their peak years of, of, of earnings, which is what, sadly, exactly what the uh, Secure Act 2.0 and the the um, the t five and ten year distribution schedules for IRAs now require. That's exactly what they tend to do is to distribute to excuse me adult children in their peak income earning years and push them into a higher marginal tax bracket. Uh, for Australian residents who are not U.S. persons, so this is Jill. Uh, the Australian Testimony Trust might be just fine. That, that might work out well. For the Australian resident uh, who is a US person, that would be Karina. She's the dual citizen. Additional structuring may be required with Australian trusts in order to manage control and US income and estate tax exposure with grantor trusts. And lastly, our friend Liam here, he is going to be in some hot water. There's significant structuring might be required with Australian trust so as to not trigger adverse tax consequences in both countries. Uh, independent Australian resident trustees and, and appointers uh, and consent of adverse persons, possibly impractical uh, to be achieved. So therefore, some other solution needs to be devised 
I would think something like Liam inherits the U.S. assets that he gets a neat step up in basis on, uh, and it, it, and and the Australian Australian uh, beneficiaries would inherit Australian taxable property to avoid the non-resident rates that apply there. What observations do we have from this? Well, Burton Janus should seek U.S. Australian cross-border tax and legal advice to confirm that they're compliant with their tax and reporting obligations. Uh, they should also seek cross-border estate planning advice when structuring their estates. Given the preceding discussion and the variations in residency and citizenship of each child, there could be differing U.S. and Australian tax consequences for each. I think that's safe to say that there would be. Uh, tax and legal advice should be sought on the U UK, Australian and US tax reporting requirements for Jill. And then lastly, uh, should be sought uh, US and Australian tax reporting requirements for Liam and Karina. So really uh, quite a complicated situation there. Uh, and even for a sizable estate of $9 million, the, the amount of legal fees that could be paid here would would I could certainly see running into the the five figures, uh, but 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 whoa hold on for just a second when I say that could be a fantastic investment compared with the alternative where if no advice is taken and it's just we let nature take its course and whatever happens happens, uh, you could be looking at six and seven figure outcomes tax penalties interest etc. Uh, if 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 things go uh, without planning. So that really concludes tonight's presentation. If you're interested perhaps in, in, in scheduling a time for a prospective client uh, appointment with me, then please come to my website. As you'll see here, the Get Started page will describe who it is that we work with, who we do our best work with. I'm happy to make a referral if your situation doesn't fit. Also, we have our key financial data sheet, previous webinars, flowcharts, white papers, all available on our website. Do join us next month. We're looking at year-end uh, tax strategies for, for US Aussie expats. So going to get into detail uh, about, uh, about things that we cross-border folks should be mindful of as the end of year approaches. That's November 26th uh, in the US. That's two days before Thanksgiving, uh, I'll have you know, which will be Wednesday, uh, at 10.30 in Brisbane. And I think Coast Daylight Savings has since happened. Uh, that's 11.30 in Sydney and Melbourne. Questions and answer time. So perhaps uh, you have uh, some questions. Please, I'll uh, just allow a couple minutes here to uh, to write them in and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Or maybe people's heads are spinning. They're just so uh, stupefied by... Caroline, good to see you here. Wonderful. Uh, U.S. permanent residents treated the same way as citizens in all cases. Practically, yes. Yes. For all important... For everything important that we've discussed here tonight, they one and the same. The, the differences between being a citizen and a, a, a legal permanent resident really only come into gift giving where there are some lower limits for what a citizen may gift to a US uh, permanent resident spouse. Unlimited gifting in the other direction, but um, but that's 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 really the really the only financial difference that I can think of. Any other questions here? Oh, someone's used the Q and A panel. Uh, cost of seeking help from you. Well, you know what? I'm proud to say, Kerry, that uh, unlike many wealth advisory firms, we proudly display our fees on our website. You can go there and take a look. Uh, I would say that that, that we are uh, very competitive for, for clients who've got more than $750,000 of assets. Uh, that's that's how I would succinctly answer your question, but the fees and the fee schedule is, is available on my website under uh, fees. I, I and services, I, I think, is the main menu there. Okay. Uh, any other questions here? I'm going to say no. It's been a minute or two since... Oh, sorry. Uh, Jillian has a question. You mentioned takes a long time to plan. When is the best time to engage? I'm in my 30s and sometimes wonder if it's better to wait till I accumulate more assets. 
You know what, Jillian, I'm going to give you an answer that I don't normally give. This is a different one. My answer to when is the best time to engage in planning is always now because I believe the benefits are compounding. I'm a, as you would expect, I'm a believer in the service and the the the, the professional advice that we provide. But to your question, I I think it's a little different. It's it, when would you do this kind of estate planning? I I have to say I would tend to agree. I, you know, until you've got um, a significant a significant and diversified pool of assets that would warrant the professional costs of dealing with this. Uh, I, I'm going to have to put a finer, finer uh, point on that one, Jillian. Some assets for newly arrived Australians can be handled simply at the account level. Oftentimes, I'll have clients that may be renting, uh, in which case their only accounts are 401ks and individual brokerage accounts that can be handled actually at a contractual level at the account. So you don't really need to worry about complicated wills and trusts. But if you've got a complicated cross-border estate with heirs of varying legal uh, statuses in various countries, that's when I think it, it would make sense to, to begin uh, engaging in this kind of advice. Peter, my understanding is leaving my uh, GC, my green card wife's assets to her Australian resident children may not cause a big problem. Okay, uh, Peter, as I mentioned earlier, this is not personal advice. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the the trust could be an issue, but if you're revising that to say if, if they're merely left to her, it's not causing a big issue. You know, probably not. If it was a primary residence, if it was an investment property, I disagree, but um, it's not going to be her primary residence because you're married, living in the US, so it's an investment property. I, I would say it's a suboptimal asset. That's There's no other better way to put it. It's why have you got this asset? Why has she got an Australian investment property while living in the US? It's being taxed as a non-resident. The income's taxes at non-resident rates, which is 30% from the very first dollar. Uh, there's also no non-resident, uh, sorry, no resident 50% capital gains discount. So she's paying full non-resident rates on whatever capital gains. I think it's a terrible asset to own in the first place. And it's even worse uh, if you've got US beneficiaries involved. That would be my two cents. Kerry, you're welcome. Uh, Carmel writes, dual Australian US parents with dual US son uh, living in the US. We have Australian will. Should we look at a US trust to replace the will? Uh, parents, goodness me, this is the sort of thing, the kind, the kind of topic where you have to really read these things closely. Dual Australian US parents with dual son living in the US. Okay, we have a strain will, should we replace? Well, typically what, what estate planners will tell you is that you would want separate wills to govern the property in each country. So for your US assets, you'd want a US will. For your Australian assets, you'd want an Australian will. That says nothing, Carmel, and your question doesn't have anything about this, but that says nothing to the efficiency or the the the, uh, the tax situation that may apply depending on what those assets actually are. But to, to the succinct answer is you want individual wills in each country. Technically, Australia and, uh, and the US are signatories to what's called the Washington Convention, which means they will honor a will from the other country, but, and this is a big but, probate needs to be granted uh, in serial in, in countries before those full distributions can be made. What's that mean in practice? That means you got to wait around for a year or two for a probate to be granted in the US and then wait around for another year or however long it takes in Australia for probate to be granted. Uh, what a ghastly experience that would be for, for your heirs compared with uh, having this neatly tied up and being able to be handled um, quickly, efficiently, and privately uh, with trusts. I th think that's everything. There's no more uh, chats that have announced. Anonymous attendee has written in to to say uh, or to ask, I've renounced my U.S. citizenship already. I'm an Australian citizen. Okay. I will have a U.S. inheritance in, say, the next five years. All right. And I have family in the U.S. to whom I will leave an inheritance eventually. Is it simpler for me now 
that I have right now. Wow, what a question. You know, I think it is. I, I think it, it it actually is simpler because you're just dealing with the the ramifications of, of one country. Uh, but let me read it again. Renounce, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will have a US inheritance in say the next five years. We know that should be once that IRS transfer certificate is granted, it might that might be a painful administrative process, but from a tax point of view, assuming your parents aren't high net worth individuals who may be subject to an estate tax, then that should, in theory, that should be okay. And I have family in the US to whom I will leave an inheritance. Um, depends on what the property is. I would suggest you watch tonight's webinar again and then think long and hard about what you want to bequeath to the US beneficiaries because it could be uh, it could it could be very tax inefficient for them. That's a wrap, folks. Thank you so much for attending tonight's webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, next month uh, we'll be on end of year tax planning. Uh, and if you happen to encounter anyone in your travels that you feel could use uh, assistance from me or my firm, then uh, please don't keep us a secret. Eric, good to see you. Look forward to chatting in the not too distant future. Thank you, everybody, and good night.